Welcome to the Trad Dads Podcast, where we examine cultural and political issues through the lens of traditional thought. All right, thanks for joining me. So today, what I want to talk about is the idea of the just price. And I'm going to be leaning on an article entitled Corporation Christendom, the True School of Salamanca. Um, And this is from the Distributist Review, uh, kind of an old online publication. And so, of course, I'll be linking directly to uh, this piece so that you can read it. But what I think is really interesting about this, you might hear some paper shuffling in the background. I apologize for that, but I'm just going through some notes. So what I found interesting about this article is that I think it provides a great response to the, uh, the folks who have told us for a long time that these uh, Spanish monks who were following Thomas Aquinas, um, you know, following in his footsteps during essentially the Renaissance are, uh, you know, are, are proof that, you know, Catholic social teaching can be, uh, is essentially the same thing as uh, sort of libertarian political uh, ideology. And you hear this from, uh, you know, of course, people who are libertarian, uh, you know, who hold to a liberal, liberal libertarian ideology. Um, and so, what I love about this article is it's pretty long, but I just want to give you a few comments on it and kind of just talk about what I thought were the, the things that stood out the most to me, since I'm fairly familiar with kind of the background. So it's good. It would be good to read this if you're not familiar with the background of this argument and this discussion, but it really is an interesting piece. So essentially what uh, the author's talking about here is, uh, again, these claims that these Renaissance monks were, you know, just, oh, see, they discovered that the just price is just garbage. And that what we really need, you know, is, is to understand is that the just price is basically the same thing as the, you know, whatever the, whatever the market determines. Okay. Uh, and so, first of all, I, th- I think there's some value from this article just purely in the recognition that, you know, just because some Renaissance era monk said something doesn't mean that it's, you know, a, a great interpretation of what Catholic social teaching is for a couple of reasons. So number one, you know, it's not like the Renaissance era was, you know, sort of the height of uh, Catholic thought. It certainly wasn't. It wasn't even anything close to that. Um, the, the, the medieval period before the Renaissance was certainly um, much better in terms of, you know, consistency with the, you know, the, the theology of the church uh, in terms of what, um, you know, social uh, policy and stuff like that. And then as we look forward in time, you know, when we look at something that's a little more um, applicable to, uh, you know, the, the institutions and, and society as it exists today, you know, we can look to the 19th century encyclicals by Leo, um, Pius XI, um, and we can read those and we can, and again, we, do, do they refer to these Renaissance monks? Of course not. They're referring to, um, you know, sort of this, uh, uh, mainly to the medieval era, but also to the intervening era, the, 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 the more faithful and consistent components of, um, you know, church teaching during the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment that, that were not sort of infected by uh, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And so, you know, what I, what I love is that he talk, he sort of takes head on this, um, that's almost like argument of argument from authority attitude, um, that you'll get from people referring to, you know, the school of Salamanca, um, you know, these, these Renaissance monks. Um, and so he, he takes on, um, some interesting writings, uh, from, uh, primarily from, uh, a chap named DeRuver. Um, you know, and, and just kind of exposes a little bit of the bias and the sort of the strength. So one of the, one of the comments that he makes, um, he, he talks about how, you know, this, this DeRuver guy is saying like, well, because the, um, because the, these Renaissance monks didn't sound like Marxists, that they are, you know, just obviously, you know, <laughs> this is a quote, that that the that their thought quote agrees with classical and neoclassical analysis. In other words, classical and neoclassical economic analysis, which is just hilarious. Um, so he goes through a lot of that part, a lot of Deruver, and he's sort of saying, 
you know, this doesn't really fit like you think it does. Um, and so, you know, I, I think uh, it, th that's a good service in the sense of sort of responding to some of these people who just claim that, you know, these guys are, uh, these Salamanca guys are just giving us, you know, essentially repeats or, or sort of um, prefigurements of, you know, uh, Adam Smith, etc. Um, and so as you go later into the article, um, he starts talking about um, DeSoto and and kind of um, digging into some of these some of the other uh, you know um, you know followers of St. Thomas uh, at the time and and discussing you know what they actually said about uh, the concept of the just price right so remember the just price just to put a little bit of framework around this in case you're new to this type of thing you know the idea of the just price is that you know, some goods should not um, just be uh, priced in a market, right? So if, if there's a good that we think is a necessity, then we can't, uh, we can't just simply allow people to charge whatever the market will bear, right? Because someone um, who's in desperate need of this thing, you know, you can come up with a scenario, right? That, um, you know, we, well, one of the, one of the scenarios uh, that's kind of, very realistic these days is, is um, you know, if we have uh, some kind of catastrophic event, right, that wipes out an area like a, a, a tornado or um, a hurricane or something like that. Well, we, you know, we're not justified, say the, the liberal libertarian types, we're not justified in putting any kind of pricing controls in place because of course, oh, that, that messes up supply and demand. Gosh, and then, you know, then we wouldn't have market incentives to bring in, you know, new goods. And so it's not like they're just saying, you know, let people die, but um, they're, they, they seem to have this religious commitment to letting markets handle everything, um, which to me is just strange. It's like, well, why? I mean, if, you know, sometimes wisdom and management outside of markets can be more effective. And especially when there's a disaster and, and they'll point to things like FEMA, you know, and, and George W. Bush and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, fine. Right. We get it. Like we can certainly critique, you know, George W. Bush and FEMA on um, sort of communitarian or subsidiarity type grounds. Right. Um, maybe those uh, maybe they should have provided some kind of assistance. But if it's, you know, if it's very much direct and, and getting in the way of local efforts, then it's a problem. Um so, you know, what, what we can say and, and what the author of this piece does a very good job of, I think, is pulling out um, discussions by other monks, um, even at the time, who are talking about things like, OK, well, maybe there are just simply different categories of goods. Right. Maybe we have necessities on the one hand and we have other things that aren't necessary for life on the other hand. And. Um, you know, I think you right away get into a problem there because a libertarian is never going to, their, 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 you know, their relativistic mindset is never going to let you say that we can place these things into these different categories. Well, what do you mean it's, it, it's a necessity and this one's not? Because Hayek said that, you know, uh, the, we, you know we, we can't, um, you know, that all these things are subjectively determined. Right. Well, that's just a relativist, right? It's just, I mean, it's essentially moral relativism talking to you. Um, and, and so, you know, of course that's silly. It's, it's bad philosophy. It's bad, it's bad metaphysics, right? Some things are necessary for life and some things aren't. And so when, when we then move into the economic discussion of these things, okay, well, so how should a price be determined? Are we justified in using some kind of, you know, dreaded market manipulation, right? Um, and of course, it's not really dreaded, but it's dreaded by, uh, you know, the libertarian types. Um, are, are, we, are we justified in allowing some kind of market um, modification, uh, some, some intervention in the market to, um, you know, ensure the provision of these, you know, necessities? And, and, and of course, there are lots of ways to try to get um, to, to try to get this, uh, you know, type of uh, outcome that we want. Right. Which is people to be able to have the things they need. Um, and, and, and I think, first of all, it's important to say that the 
the the the left wing answer is also wrong, right? The left wing answer is, well, um, you know, just provide these things through the government, right? Well, that's a violation of subsidiarity, right? The family can handle, right? And family, I mean, you know, uh, extended family. Family can handle provision for basic necessities for itself, and therefore it should. It should not fall to the community or some larger authority um, in, in, in normal circumstances to provide for, um, you know, a family. Uh, it just, that's not the way it should be. Now, if it's, there's an extraordinary circumstance, fine, right? But that should not be the normal um, way things are done for a family. And so that has implications too, right? So that, one of the implications there, uh, and, and one of the, one of the solutions you'll sometimes hear from sort of centrist type libertarians is, well, let's just let the market handle pricing and then we'll deal with, um, you know, we'll, we'll deal with the welfare issues, right? And, and welfare, welfare in the sort of economic theory context of that term, not welfare in, in the context of just like a policy that gives people money. Although in this case, um, you know, we're actually kind of talking about the same thing there. Um, you know, and so the proposal is, well, let, let markets handle prices, right? Don't intervene in markets at all. Let prices set wherever they are. Um, but then when you find that some people can't afford stuff, just give them money, right? To, to, um, to, to offset this and whether, you know, how you do that is of course, you know, whether that's negative income taxes or, or something like that. Um, you know, the idea is that you just deal with the income consequences separately from the pricing issues. And, and that is supposedly more efficient. And of course, you know, stipulated, whatever, you know, you can, you can call anything you want efficient, right? The, um, it's <laughs> what you call efficient is based on what you value, right? So, um, that's not really an argument. Um, but so what, why I think this is wrong headed, this whole income thing, why I think this is wrong headed is because, um, you know, again, a family can provide for itself. And so um, this whole idea of providing, uh, you know, for the income side, separately from the issue of price, completely ignores that it completely ignores the notion that the family should be able to provide for itself. Now that just just because we're saying families should be able to provide for themselves, doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some kind of policy to help facilitate that. But, and, and this, this will become a little clearer here in a minute when I talk about another alternative here. But again, let me reiterate, right? The, the idea is not that there shouldn't be some kind of policy in place to ensure that families can provide for themselves, but just handing them money or just sending them a basket of food every week is not self-provision in any sense, right? So, you know, that that is another policy avenue that I think probably should be um, sort of put uh, uh, to the side. Another alternative, and, and, and an alternative discussed here in this article as well, is um, to simply, uh, you know, Im implement price controls. Now, you know, I, I think for the most part, this article just talks about price controls, and I think that um, there's room to, crit to criticize that sort of thing, right? So, but the idea would be, okay, instead of, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, letting the market do whatever it wants, right? There is no such thing as a just price. A just price is just whatever the market will bear. Okay, so we've put that to the side. That that cannot be um, consistent with Catholic social teaching at all. Um, the second one being, uh, you know, well, just let prices do what they want, and then if you have welfare consequences, then give people money, right? So that doesn't work either from a subsidiarity standpoint. Um, so in this case, when when the author is talking about price controls, right, you're talking about price controls specifically for necessity items, right? So of course we're relying on some wisdom on the part of you know, the people in charge of those, um, uh, you, you know, in charge of these policies, the implementation of these policies, fine. We're always reliant on wisdom, right? We're always reliant on that. I don't want to get into some kind of metapolitical discussion, right? The, not everything has to become a metapolitical discussion. Um, so we're reliant on some kind of wisdom to determine, you know, what those, uh, what those numbers ought to be, or, you know, how, how these price controls ought to be implemented. Um, and, and for what goods, right? What goods are determined to be a necessity? 
I mean, we can go to someone to talk about that, right? We can talk to the, you know, the, the um, you know, we can get we can get advice from different people, right? We can get advice from uh, medical folks. We can get uh, advice from people who work with, uh, you know, um, those who are poor. We can get advice from the church, right? We can, um, you know, civil authorities can get advice from a lot of different people to figure that out. Now, the reason why I would say, you know, maybe price controls themselves are not the best thing is because, you know, we do get um, problems. You know, we, we do get uh, shortages and um, and uh, surpluses. But so I think maybe a slightly better way of dealing with this would be um, instead of a straight up price control where we just limit the price, you know, either either downward or upward um, is, is, is a subsidy kind of scheme. Right. So. And, and of course, most countries have this thing, right? Most countries subsidize agriculture. Now, sometimes that has really weird effects outside of, uh, you know, the, the intention. But the intention is to ensure that people have affordable food. Um, and, and so you have to be cognizant of the limitations of this. But the limitations aren't, um, it never works and it doesn't, and it's no good and we just can't do it, right? Which is the libertarian perspective. Um, so... I think that uh, rather than just an overt price control, um, perhaps some kind of subsidy that results in a price um, that you would be targeting, right? So you're 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 targeting a certain price, and rather than just simply barring people from selling above that price, you just simply manipulate the supply side with subsidies um, in order to push the price lower. Now, do you do this for everything? Absolutely not, right? And in, and in fact, the the author of this article does a great job of you know, pointing out that, the, you know, this idea of just price just doesn't belong to everything. It It is important for some things and other things that aren't necessities don't need to fall under the sway of a subsidy, right? And so does that, now, do, do we do we still have the possibility of, you know, public choice concerns, right? People, uh, you know, getting subsidies for things that aren't necessities, you know, so it prompts up their business and this and that. Sure. And again, that's why we, it falls back to wisdom. And that wisdom is, is no less of a um, necessity and a concern in markets than it is in anything else, right? The wisdom of crowds is not wisdom, <laughs> right? People still, real people still have to make real judgment calls in real time. And, and you, you can't just, you know, align incentives with markets, right? That doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem of putting the right people in the right place. Um, and of course, that doesn't argue that policy is, is perfect. Of course it doesn't. It doesn't argue that policy doesn't have some kind of unintended consequence. Of course they do. But just because there are the possibility for unintended consequences, just because there is the possibility of corruption, just because there is a possibility of unwise uh, you know, people in charge, doesn't mean that we can't use it, right? Sort of the flip of the Nirvana fallacy we get from Harold Demsetz. Um, and maybe I'll do a show on that eventually, but just look up Nirvana fallacy, Harold Demsetz, and if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but again, my, my point is that, you know, just because the policy isn't perfect doesn't mean we can't implement it. And, and it seems like you get that argument, at least implicitly, from a lot of people that are, you know, that push this idea that the, that the Salamanca Renaissance, you know, uh, uh, you know, monks were, were, man, they were just free marketeers, obviously ridiculous. And, you know, the, the first clue is they were during the Renaissance, right? You got to be really careful about, you know, who you're trusting and, you know, um, in the time leading up to the Protestant Reformation or revolution, excuse me, Protestant Revolution. Um, so I think that's about all I have on that. Um, and I, I want to, I want to say that I'm going to continue, I think down this route of kind of talking about libertarian shibboleths, you know, the libertarian, um, you know, critiques and stuff like that. I think there's a ton of fruitful ground here and I want to just keep covering these types of issues. I do apologize again for my lack of episodes. I'm, uh, you know, I'm still kind of, um, in, in a really weird, uh, life situation right now. So I'm trying to, to get, be more consistent and, um, hopefully my, uh, uh, my work ethic and my life situation will both modify in a positive direction and, and I will, uh, I'll be more consistent. Uh, but with that, I do thank you for listening and I hope you'll, uh, consider, you know, reaching out on Twitter or something like that. 
and uh, would love to hear back from you. Uh, that's, uh, let's see, it's at trad dads. Um, then you can email me at tradeconomist at gmail.com if you want. Uh, otherwise, um, would love to hear, you know, you can leave a message on the Anchor app if you want to, um, if you're listening over Anchor. Uh, so I appreciate that, and I hope uh, all of you have a great day. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Trad Dads podcast. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes. It really helps us out.